Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Atsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode 77 of ADHD for Smartass Women. Before we start, I want to remind you that we are in the middle of our Founders Member launch of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. We are going to start the program together on June 30th, and I talked all about my patented six-step AOK system in last week's podcast. If you are struggling to answer that, what do I do with my life question, and know that you need help around discovering exactly who you are, what's important to you, what your strengths, passions, and purpose are, you can find more information about AOK by going to tracyotsuka.com forward slash A-OK. If you want to fall in love with your ADHD brain and flip that switch from seeing everything that's wrong with it to everything that's brilliant and inspired and right with it, this program, it's for you. So now let's get down to business. In this episode, I am going to introduce you to the lovely Jacqueline Levine Pritzker. Jack, is what she calls herself, or at least I think her good friends call her that, so I'm going to call her Jack, is a certified health life coach through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, and she's also an ADCA-trained ADHD coach, which hands down is the best ADHD coaching program out there, and I know this firsthand. Jack founded Authentically ADHD, where she coaches and runs retreats and ADHD slumber parties, so we're going to have to find out all about that. And like me, Jack also went to law school. Did I get all that right, Jack? Yes, you did. That was very impressive. And you even pronounced my full name correctly. (laughs) Good, but I'm going to stick with Jack. So I don't quite remember how we met, if it was through Instagram or if it was through my group or whatever. But I remember that we started to have a conversation and I thought, oh my gosh, I just love your energy and your personality and what you bring to a conversation. And then I found out you were also a fellow law school graduate. And so I thought, you know what? I need to talk to Jack because what I've noticed that our listeners really love is they love to hear from real women about their ADHD diagnoses and how they have spun that diagnosis into something that, you know, they really love, whether it's a career, whether it's relationships, you know, whatever you want to talk about. So welcome, Jack. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much, Tracy. I don't recall exactly how we started talking, but I've been in love with your podcast and your Facebook group for a really long time and have benefited so much from listening. So I'm really honored to now get to be on here with you and chat with you and share my story. So thank you. Absolutely. I love your story. The thing about it, though, is I just know bits and pieces. So can we start at the beginning and just talk about how you were diagnosed? Yeah, of course. So I was diagnosed sometime in my early life, I think sometime in 
elementary school, I was having some different issues. I don't particularly remember getting diagnosed or going through that. And my parents didn't really do anything about it. So it's not something I kind of like went my whole life being like, yeah, I think I have ADHD. But I, I, I thought that just meant I couldn't focus. You know, I didn't actually understand what it meant. You know, what's so interesting about that, Jack, is that comment I hear more and more where yeah. you, know, you have a young woman who was diagnosed early in life, but it was just sort of, I don't know, sweeped under the rug. They never learned yeah. anything about it in the back of their mind. You know, they have this idea that, yeah, I think I was diagnosed, but they don't know anything more than that. Right. Right. Yeah. It's so wild. So then have you talked to your parents about it? I have. I haven't actually had a full, like, in-depth conversation really with them about it. It's something that I would love to kind of circle back to now that I, you know, have kind of dedicated my entire life to it. You know, they're both totally open and supportive. And, you know, it's definitely not in the realm of their full understanding. Yeah, Okay. So you were diagnosed, you think, sometime when you were young, not quite sure when. And then what happened after that? Yeah. So after that, I kind of went on through life and, you know, made it through. It wasn't until law school um, where I was Can really- Can I stop you, Jack, for a second? Of so course. when you say you just kind of went on, what led up to the diagnosis? Meaning- did you struggle in school? Were you struggling with relationships? Like, how did you even, do you know anything around that? Do you remember anything? Yeah. So as I, I really struggled in law school and I'll go into that also, but I, I do see leading up to that high school, you know, I did not do well grade wise. It was kind of not seen as a huge deal by my parents because I was so involved in extracurriculars and really social and like doing really well in other areas. I remember in undergrad, you know, I had like a 3.9 GPA. I was doing really well, but I can recall and can see looking back like the extra effort that it took me and the extra stress and late nights compared to a lot of my other friends. So you seem to work a lot harder than your yeah. peers. Yeah. Now, in elementary school, were you like a B student or were you a really good A student as well, solid A student? I honestly don't have many childhood memories. I don't really know, but I do recall being in like actually a, I, I got sent to like a program that I think meant I had good grades. So I'm pretty sure I did well in elementary school. It wasn't until middle school that I definitely started struggling more. Okay. But now your diagnoses when you were younger, do you have any memories at all? Was it because you were chatting all the time? You were interrupting? You weren't following instructions? Because it sounds like you were a pretty good student. Yeah. I honestly don't really know. I know what I've heard from my parents. And again, I'm actually glad this is coming up because it's really encouraging me to you know, take that step and have more of an in-depth conversation with them. But I do remember that you know, my parents and everyone was always saying I was very spacey. And that's like the term that I sort of remember most. And then the only memory that I really have of some of the testing that I was doing, I remember it came back with, you know, difficulty with auditory processing and some... It's a common one. Yeah. My son had that one too. Yeah. So some things like that. But yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a great memory or haven't had the chance to really dive into the earlier stages of this yet. Perfect. Okay. So you go to college. So you must have had good enough grades to get to college. And you didn't struggle in college. It sounds like you did really well, at least academically. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely heavily medicated with pot throughout college. And while that was fun at the time, looking back, I can see the ways in which I was, you know, coping and didn't know how to really calm down my mind or relax or, you know, deal with any of the overwhelm or emotions in any other way. Did you feel like that proverbial duck where the outward appearances, you know, it's all about, oh, well, she's a 3.9, you know, student. She's 
really smart, but underneath you're just paddling, just trying to keep up because it's all so overwhelming. I mean, is that kind of what the pot was about, was trying to reduce the anxiety? Yeah, I think that through undergrad, not as much. It was definitely there. And looking back, I can see the ways in which I was struggling that I wasn't even able to acknowledge. But it wasn't really until law school where the pot use and more of the negative coping mechanisms and just feeling totally unseen and like, yeah, like I was doing well, but no one saw the behind the scenes, all of the tears and all of that kind of stuff. Got it. Okay. So tell us what happened in law school. Was law school something that you were really passionate about and you really wanted to do? Or was it more, oh, I just kind of want to keep going in education? Um, it's kind of complex. So I was very passionate about it. I went to CUNY Law School in Queens, which is the top human rights law school in the country. And so I went without the intention of actually becoming a lawyer, but rather to further my education and resources around organizing work and work within the human rights field. So I was very passionate about this subject matter and kind of my why behind going to law school. And my dad is a judge and I grew up around law and definitely was, you know, somewhat influenced into that direction. So it's, it's a little bit of both. (laughs) That's so interesting. So clearly you had that ADHD trait of justice sensitivity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop interrupting you, but I'm just, I'm so interested. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Thank you. Let us know what happened in law school. Yeah. So law school was really brutal for me and I would go as far to call it a traumatic experience for me for multiple reasons. I really, really struggled in law school for a lot of reasons, <laughs> some ADHD related, some not. But the ones that are more ADHD related are, I started really experiencing depression and anxiety. I didn't even know that it was anxiety at the time, but really kind of panic attacks. I started uh oh, my cat's meowing in the background. I'm sorry. That's if you didn't okay. Know. We all have animals. <laughs> um, I started, you know, pulling out my hair to the point where I developed like a little bald patch. And I was just chronically overwhelmed, struggling with like I would read a flashcard like 700 times and it just wouldn't go into my brain. I did well in law school. I think I had like a 3.4, a 3.5 GPA. I can't remember. But, you know, from the outside looking in, I did well. But the behind the scenes of it were really, really a struggle. And I just couldn't comprehend why my friends were able to like, you know, law school is hard for everyone. But I had friends that were still like going out and hanging out with their friends and were able to like study in a time block and just like focus and get it done. and. I was just so confused. And I ended up going to the school therapist because I was like, I'm really like depressed and anxious. Like something's going on here. And I had never been to a therapist before. And within a couple of sessions, she asked me like, hey, have you ever been diagnosed with anything and with anything in your life? And I was like, well, I kind of think I was diagnosed with ADHD. I'll have to ask my parents. (laughs) But I don't think that's really what's at play here. And she was like, "Um, you should probably see a psychiatrist. (laughs) So I ended up, I think, as so many of us do, going down the rabbit hole of obsessively researching everything there is to know about ADHD ever in the whole universe. So that's so interesting, though, Jack, that the therapist at school knew enough not to just say woman, anxiety, depression, but literally listen to, oh, I was diagnosed with ADHD and actually ran with that or made you, you know, move forward with that. So that's really encouraging. It is. I'm really, really grateful for her. I kind of, I obviously have no idea about her personal life, but some of the things she said led me to believe she may have ADHD Ah. herself, or at least like has a loved one 
with ADHD. She seemed like very knowledgeable about it. So I'm really grateful she pointed me in that direction. Absolutely. Okay. So then what did you do? (laughs) So (laughs) yeah, I I totally learned everything and realized, well, not everything, but a ton. And was this before you even went in to see a psychiatrist? You just did all the research? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got totally, I'm like the type of ADHD that, like, my issue is more pulling out of hyper focus. I got Mm -hmm. so obsessive and. And just started reading articles and realizing like, oh, wow, ADHD is not just like this, you know, thing where boys like jump around in the seat. Like this explains so much about my life. And then I ended up going to a psychiatrist who diagnosed me with ADHD inattentive type, moderate to severe. Mm -hmm. Although I would argue I'm combined type probably. (laughs) And this was way towards the end of law school. I think it was my last semester of law school. You were not diagnosed until your last semester of law school? It was either the last semester or the second to last semester, but it was really close to the end of law school. Yeah. Okay. And did you try medication? Well, and I guess that totally makes sense why you were also Mm self-medicating. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So were you able to try medication and does it work for you? I was able to try medication. I went on Ritalin and at first it was so incredible. And I also want to just mention, I didn't start Ritalin without like major debates with myself. Like if anyone knows me in person, I'm like a total like hippie, holistic health kind of (laughs) chick. So, you know, this wasn't a decision made without a lot of processing, but I did decide to do it. And it was really amazing at first. And then I took it through the bar exam. And I've tried meds twice. And each time my experience, and I know this isn't the experience for many people, it felt like it worked really well at first. And it was like, oh my God, it's like putting on glasses and this is amazing. And then it always ends up making me like more obsessive and more I don't know. The side effects just never end up feeling worth it for me. So I ended up coming off Ritalin um, after the bar exam. But you were able to take it, it sounds like, for a couple weeks at least and really get benefit from it. And then after that, it just sort of didn't work as well. Yeah, I think of the first time I took it probably for like five months. I took it for a while. And actually, interestingly enough, like two days before the bar exam, Bar prep was like absolute hell for me. I cried every single day. I was so anxious. I was so overwhelmed. I couldn't remember anything. It was horrible. But about two days before the bar exam, which I failed, which I'll go into after, um, (laughs) I accidentally double dosed my Ritalin. So I was on 10 milligrams and I ended up taking a second dose, like having forgotten that I took the first dose, which I knew was like, (laughs) <laughs> something that happens. And yeah. I took a practice test without knowing this at the time. And my score went up like so drastically. And I finished early. Wow. And I usually finished way late. And I was like, what is going on here? This is like such a weird thing. And then my dad mentioned that I was being like extra chatty. <laughs> and um, I just kind of pieced it together and went back and counted my meds and realized I had Um, double dosed and that perhaps I was on too low of a a dose for most of the time I was on it. Oi, that's insane though, that just by taking Ritalin, your score would go up that high, which clearly indicates that the brain power is all there. Right. Uh, Yeah. It was really wild. Okay. So did you decide then after that even though you had that phenomenal experience, there was just too many negative side effects that I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah, it was that. And also, I felt like after law school that I was going to try to create my life in a way that I didn't need to rely as much on meds. It's also really complicated with the fact that I have candida and mold illness and all of these things that are really taxing on my liver already. Uh, so my preference you know, is always to not take the meds if I can. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm totally supportive of 
anyone who chooses to take them at any point (laughs) as well. Got it. Got it. I completely agree. I wish it worked for me. So those times that I have to do long form writing, I could take it then. But yeah, the symptoms are just not worth it. I'm just completely Mm -hmm. anxious and not good. Okay. So tell us what happened after that. Okay. So I really suffered through the bar exam. I'm now, you know, on an unrelated note, kind of as I've just recently been diagnosed with black mold illness, like looking into whether I was experiencing mold while I was studying, which was increasing my symptoms during studying for the bar. I took the bar exam. I knew I failed it. (laughs) Everyone was like, no, you didn't. Like you always do well. And I was like, no, but you don't understand. My brain literally like wasn't working. (laughs) And were you on the Ritalin when you took it? Yeah, I was. But I think just like the anxiety, I was experiencing Mm. such extreme anxiety. I remember my arm, like I was trying to like type and like my arms went numb. The air conditioner was broken and it kept making a sound. And I was like hyper-focused on that sound. I'm very sensory sensitive. And then there was a girl crying behind me. And I think what I experienced now that I'm a little more familiar with my body and myself was like major sensory overload and my body, I just totally shut down. Oh, geez. Not fun. (laughs) I am so sorry. (laughs) I just, oh, so keep going. Yeah. So by the time I chose to take the bar, I should mention, I already knew that I probably wasn't going into law or at least as a lawyer. So I was kind of taking it more just because I felt like I made it through law school, I should, you know, take the exam. I ended up moving to California. So if I passed the New York bar, it would have been pointless anyway. And I had some serious thinking to do about what I wanted my life to look like. Can I ask why you ended up moving to California? Yeah, honestly, kind of just on an ADHD impulse whim. I love California. I always have. I love warm weather. And it just kind of aligned. I decided to move to California before I knew about the bar exam results. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a remote job working for sales for this really cool, like sustainable food company. And my friend in California, who I had studied abroad in India with and hadn't seen in a really long time, reached out and said her and her boyfriend broke up. She needs a roommate. Am I interested? And I was like, yeah, sure. So how did your dad feel about all of this? Yeah. So he was really supportive throughout. Oh. And there is definitely a lot that has gone unsaid between my dad and I. I know that he unconditionally loves me and he knows the same. And there's some awkwardness there and some discomfort around, you know, this whole situation. And, you know, he was really pushing for me to retake the bar for a while and really pushing me into law with really good intentions. And I think he's, you know, recently realized, you know, I've created a whole business and I'm really passionate and happy with what I'm doing. So he's really taken a step back and been really supportive of my current ventures. That's so wonderful. He sounds like a wonderful father. He is. Yeah. Okay. So you get your bar results. Yes. And... (laughs) I get my bar results and it was def I was in California already. I remember kind of going through some different emotions with it. At first, I was definitely really mean to myself about it and bashing myself and you know all of my friends passed pretty much, so I was pretty down on myself about it. And I was planning on retaking it for a while. And after sitting with myself a lot and really looking at myself in the mirror, I realized that sometimes quitting is the best thing we can do for ourselves. And that if I were to retake the bar and even taking the bar in the first place, even finishing law school in the first place was really a matter of ego and 
just trying to prove myself and get these credentials to feel good about myself and not feeling like I was allowed to change my mind or quit. I didn't want to carry that with me anymore. So I really listened to what I wanted at this point. I got my health coach certification in my last year of law school because wow. I have way too many interests, surprise, surprise, and take on way too many things. But also because I already knew that I was in the wrong, <laughs> the wrong realm. And I became really passionate about mental health and self-care and wanting to, for the first time, instead of trying to take care of the entire world, try to figure out what it meant to take care of myself. That's lovely. I'm wondering, can you go back as far as you remember? And do you see that, hey, I was always interested in health and, you know, helping other people and, uh, you know, that whole thing? Yes. I know you said you were really into human rights. So there's a connection, definitely. Oh, yeah. So I've definitely, you know, ever since middle school, I was like that middle schooler playing like Save Darfur videos in the lunch cafeteria, trying to like get people to join my club for human rights. I was always really passionate about those types of things. And my health thing kind of came about in a really unhealthy way that thankfully has been turned into a much more productive thing for me. But I really struggled with disordered eating and body dysmorphia. I was kind of chronically dieting. I actually got into really into fitness and into I became a beach body coach before law school. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah. And for anyone that's into it, awesome. That's great for you. I totally support that. It was really harmful for me in a lot of ways. Mm. However, it did give me a little taste of like working with people and giving people support and encouragement and cheering people on. And I really liked that. And so I decided to leave that. And that's when I went into health coaching because I wanted to do more of like the holistic health kind of things. That's interesting, Jack, because I always say that the best purposes are those that give meaning to your past. Mm, so, you yeah. know, it's something that we've been through and we want to help other people maybe have an easier time of it. Right. I love that. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, when I moved to California, I was working full time. For a company. And then I was also starting to build out my business, which at the time was called Soul Shine Healing. And I was doing a lot of work with women on body image issues and kind of like self love, confidence kind of things. And I was really loving that. And I was starting to make money from that and starting to see that kind of take off. And then I had one client who was not diagnosed with ADHD, but I was like so certain that she was. And I was able to really support her in like such a different way, like with so much depth. And it kind of started, you know, turning my wheels. And I kind of got re obsessed with ADHD again, started reading everything. And I decided to start authentically ADHD Instagram account last year in January. And I did it kind of just as an experiment. I already had my thing going and I I kind of just wanted to connect with people and see what the community was like and see if there even was a need for this and like what was going on. I was really kind of naive to like the whole scene. So I created the Instagram and it really took off really fast, like way faster than I expected. And from there, from you know January of last year, I've been building out Authentically ADHD to what it is now. I think it's so interesting because I hear this story over and over, and I can certainly relate. I think with our ADHD, we get to a point, and then we just want a community, right? We want people mm -hmm. to share you know, yeah. the trials, the tribulations, and and the incredible workarounds that we've been able to develop for ourselves as well. And know, is this part of ADHD? Are you right. experiencing this as well? I mean, there's really yeah. that community aspect. So I completely hear you. Okay. So I've got a question I pretty much ask everybody that I'd love to ask you. So once you knew it was ADHD, so you are at the end of law school, 
And you discover this, that, oh my gosh, it's ADHD and it's inattentive, primarily inattentive ADHD. So you have the benefit of hindsight then. I'd love to know what are some of the symptoms that you always wondered about? Like, why do I do that? But now you recognize them as, oh my gosh, that was my ADHD. (laughs) So many. I think that, you know, for starters, I've, I've always been either like a skin picker or like a nail biter or something like that. And like pulling out my hair in law school, you know, I've now come to realize the link between that stuff with, I think the emotional. And then I think the, probably the biggest like aha moments for me have been mostly around the emotional component of it. And I loved your episode on bipolar versus ADHD and how confusing it can be. And I really resonated with that because I've, you know, asked my therapist like 700 times, are you sure I'm not bipolar? Because like, I really am like all over the place emotionally. And of course, I don't mean to make light of bipolar. And I understand it, it is a different and very serious condition. But yeah, I think the kind of emotional ups and downs in my life make so much more sense now. I think decision fatigue, I never realized, you know, I think so much of my stress in my entire life has come from making decisions. And I never really connected that with ADHD until I've like experienced every single one of my clients who, you know, deal with that as well. There's so many things. I mean, I think like a lot of my chronic health issues, I've seen as relating to ADHD and my nervous system and and stress. No, I mean, that's a lot. And I, (laughs) yeah, I can relate to so many of them. So can you tell us now, so what has changed since you were diagnosed? Like for you? Yeah. So I think at first I experienced the diagnosis as like something is wrong with me. How can I fix it? And I kind of took that approach for a long time and that has long passed. And so I'm, you know, now in the stage of discovery with ADHD. While I totally get that living as a person with ADHD in a world that is so not designed for our brains is traumatic and stressful and overwhelming and causes so many issues. And that's really valid. And I, I get that, that it's also something that is a really amazing part of me. And I've really come to be able to embrace how different, how nonlinear my brain works, embrace my highs and embrace my lows and embrace my hyperfocus and embrace my down days. And really just come to appreciate fully who I am with my ADHD and with neurodiversity and sensitivity and all of those things in the mix. So I feel really empowered by it. I wouldn't want to be different than who I am. Oh my God. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. So Jack, have you always felt different than others? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. In one way or another. Definitely. I mean, I think that, like, I remember in middle school really being, like, so obsessed and concerned about the world and, like, what was going on and genocide and, like, all of these really horrific things. And I, like, would constantly, like, talk to my friends and, like, try to pull people into clubs and, (laughs) and, you know, all of these things. And I never really felt like that was like understood. I also grew up in a really, really, really small rural town. So that was definitely not, you know, the focus of people. So I definitely felt different then. So you were just always really intense when you felt things, man, you wanted to just do everything you could to change that feeling. Oh, yeah. Better. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) I can relate. Exactly. Yep. (laughs) So knowing what you know now, What do you think the key is to living successfully with ADHD? If you had to pick like one major thing that every, it's kind of the axis that everything spins on, what would it be? Hmm. 
I say this all the time and people always ask me to elaborate. So I'm sorry if this is too vague, but I really think it comes down to recognizing that we are not wrong or bad. Our brains are not broken. They're merely different. And that I like the analogy of a garden and I might get this wrong because I'm on like two hours of sleep because I had a huge insomnia thing last night. (laughs) But that if a flower is not blooming, you don't ask what's wrong with the flower. You ask what's wrong with the environment and what's wrong with the things around it and what does that flower need. And so I really like thinking of ADHD and neurodiversity that way that we as the flower are not wrong or bad, that if we can on many levels, on like a political level and a societal level and on a personal level, do everything we can to design our lives around our ADHD. So whether that means career, whether that means what time you wake up in the morning, whether that means like the kind of relationship you're in, you know, really adjusting our circumstances and environment rather than us. Absolutely. That is such fabulous advice. It all starts with environment as far as I'm concerned too. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. And just to add quickly, I know you said one thing, but I do think it's important to note that I think in addition to that, that community, which you obviously, you know, have one of the best communities in your Facebook group and through this podcast. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I don't think it can be done on an individual level. I think we really need each other. We need to talk to other women, non-binary folks, other people who are experiencing the same things that we are and to really, you know, heal and minimize the shame together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Jack, last question. And then I want you to tell us about what you're doing and where people can find you. I want you to give me your, I don't know, number one or two best ADHD workarounds, like something that you just rely on every day. Hmm. For me, I'll always say exercise. If I don't start my day with exercise, I'm just, Mm -hmm. you know, SOL. So I'm curious if you have something like that. Yeah, I guess it's kind of a random one, but I think for me, like a big activator for my brain exercise is amazing too. I haven't been able to as much because of some of my chronic fatigue stuff, but I'm totally on board with that. I think for me, a huge activator that's kind of random is consuming inspiring content. So for example, like if I start my day, I have a couple of like YouTubers or podcasters, you included things that really inspire me. My brain is so activated by that. And so if I have to like clean the house or something, and of course I'm like, that's the literal last thing that my brain wants to do. Instead of trying to force myself into that, I'll put on like a YouTube video of someone like organizing their pantry and making it look all like pretty and with colors and everything like that. And that for some reason is like one of the biggest kind of activators for me. That's so interesting. You know, that's a really creative idea because what you're basically doing is sort of creating a body double, even though they don't know it, right? Yes, exactly. (laughs) I'll kind of like put it on and like halfway through the video, I'll like end up getting up and start to do things. And then, you know, once you're in it, you're in it. Right. And then you can't get out of it, which yeah, is exactly. getting hyper focus. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that one. I've never heard that, but I think that that's a really good one. So thank you for sharing <laughs> that with us. So, okay. First of all, you've got to tell us about what the ADHD sleepovers are. That just sounds like a hoot. And then yeah. I'd love to know what you're doing, what you're working on. Is there anything you want to share with us? Awesome. So the ADHD slumber party, we haven't had, our first one is going to be in September, although I'm not sure what's going to be happening with COVID at that time. So it's kind of up in the air, but it's an ADHD retreat for women and non-binary folks. And I rented out this beautiful Airbnb in Northern California, like in the woods and the mountains. We're going to be doing a mix of self-care, of breath work, of sharing circles. I'll be doing one-on-one with people. I really envision it being a place for both personal development, but also like deep relaxation 
and connection. So that's a three night long thing in September. I was supposed to write down the date before this, but I didn't. But if anyone's interested, just reach out and I will send over the details. It's also available on my website. And what is your website? And we'll make sure we put it in the show notes too. Yeah. So my website is www.authenticallyadhd.com. Perfect. And you can find all the different things on there. Yeah. Including the retreat. Wonderful. Because you do coaching and do you still do health coaching? Um, No. So I do what I consider life coaching for women and non-binary folks with ADHD. So I don't really consider myself necessarily like an ADHD coach. Like I'm not just doing like executive function stuff. It's more just like overall life coaching with a twist for ADHD people. So I do one-on-one coaching, group coaching, and I have a monthly membership as well. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's what I saw. I forgot about that. Okay. Yeah. The membership's fun. And so they can find out anything about all of these things on your website, authenticallyadhd.com. Yes. And there's a lot more information and I'm a lot more active on my Instagram account is where I hang out mostly. So that's just at authenticallyadhd. I've got a bunch of story highlights with all of this stuff as well. And if someone were to want to contact me, the best way to do that is probably through email. Tracy, I think you were like mentioning how hard uh, like DMs are to keep up with. So please email me. Um, (laughs) It's authenticallyadhd at gmail.com. Feel free to just say like, hey, here's my story. Where can you point me? I'll kind of get on board with that with you. Okay. I am going to ask you, Jack, to please, I know they all kind of sound exactly the same. And so you'd think I'd be able to, you know, put that all together, but I'm afraid of making a mistake. So if you could send me all those links. Yeah, of course. um, And then I will make sure that they get just the way you want them in our show notes. Yeah, you got it. Perfect. Jack, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. It was such a privilege to finally speak with you um, and to learn more about you. And I'm so happy that you were willing to come here and talk to us. Thank you, Tracy. It's been amazing. It's so funny because I'm kind of like a stranger to you, but I've listened to so many of your podcasts that I feel like we're already friends. So it's been amazing actually getting to chat with you. And again, I'm really, really honored. You've created something so special. And so thank you for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure completely. Okay. So that's what I have for you for this week. As always, you are listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this episode with Jack, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too can discover their amazing strengths. And you know what? Your reviews, they really help in that regard. For me, they're like those little gold stars we used to get on our work when we were kids in school. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me an audio message or reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.